Hey guys, Jeff here. I'm back at the basement and today we are installing our doors and our trim. And we're doing a very modern take on doors and trim, which is really good for you because modern materials can be designed so that you don't have to use miter joints when you're doing your casing. And that means that even as a beginner or a DIYer, you can get a really good modern look and save a lot of time and a lot of frustration. So let's just jump right into this. What we have here is a standard frame. When I arrived, the framing was already done. And they set up their framing at 83 inches. Yep, and they were smart. They did their hole two inches bigger than the door. That's all very standard. And they gave us a little extra room on top, an inch and a half, because the door comes traditionally about 81 and a half inches door with a jam. That's an important thing to know. What they didn't take into account is the fact that the homeowner was gonna put in a subfloor system. So now I have subfloor system and hardwood flooring because I believe in putting in your flooring first and then in putting on your doors and trim because it gives you a much cleaner look as a DIYer. I know that the trade pros will do the doors first and all the trim work and then they do flooring last. But in order to do that, you've got to have professional tools and jam saws and everything else. So my system is designed to help you guys get a professional look. And that means we're gonna to have to customize our doors. We have a standard 80 inch height door and standard width. What we have to do now is measure backwards to make sure that when we install it, we have enough room so we can shim it and square it and level it and plumb it. So what we wanna do is measure off our finished space. Now, from the flooring up to the two by four, I'm 80 and a half. I'm an inch too tall already. And I don't want to just stick it in and use that full measurement. So I'm going to, I'm going to take a quarter inch off. We're going to go with our measurement at 80 and a quarter tall. And just double check my width. 30 inches here, 30 here, and I'm 30 here. Well, that's good. So that has the potential to be square. But because I have a 28 inch door with jams, my full width is 29 and a half. It's not a lot of wiggle room. So what I want to do is I want to throw a level on this thing and just make sure that I'm not 30, 30, and 30, right? Now you could use a laser level if you have it. That is actually good. Somebody built this thing and they were paying attention and they used a level. Okay, so we're gonna be good. Now what we gotta do is take this information, 80 and a quarter, and translate that and cut down my jams and my door so that when I'm in done, I'm gonna install a door that'll swing open and have a little bit of gap on the ground. Okay, let's go do that. So I've got my door jam set up here on my table and I'm gonna be measuring the outside dimension. Our measurement was 80 and a half for the hole, so we're gonna go 80 and a quarter. I'm just gonna make a mark on each side. The hole for the door here is also a crucial element. We're gonna make sure that this space here is relatively level. There is a slightest slope, so the hinge side is just a little bit taller. Now, we're gonna take this 80 and a quarter, and we're gonna take it back just a hair. Gonna take back another eighth. Because the floor is on a slope, we're gonna cut this one a little bit shorter. That way, the finished jam will sit on the floor on each side, all right? To cut this, we're gonna use our triangle to create an inverted table saw here. And so there's my spot. I'm gonna pinch that. In order to get this going, I've gotta pull the safety because I'm using it upside down backwards. Okay. There we go. And then the same was over here, only this one. <laughs> I've gotta go the backwards. I'm just lining up where my saw blade touches my pencil. When I do this, I'm only focusing on the square and this blade. I'm not looking at what I'm cutting. There we go. All right, now, very important when you're working with your doors, you've established the swing. Here we are. That fits really nicely. All right, now that's not going anywhere. One more measurement you wanna get, the height of the door, which is different. I'm gonna measure from the hinge side of the floor, which was the high point, to the underside of that jam, which is 79 and a half. I know there's gonna be an eighth of an inch gap because the door is always a little smaller on top. And I wanna have a gap on the bottom. And I don't want the gap to be too little because that's just asking for trouble. So we're gonna to go to 79 and an eighth. That'll give us a quarter on the bottom and an eighth on top. The key to doing things right is writing it down. There we go, we got our number. Let's pull out our door and I'll show you what I'm working with. Now, there's a chance this is in the way. I'm just gonna get rid of this. This is part of the packaging to keep the door from opening up during transport. Here we go. Here we are. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is take a straight edge and I'm gonna connect the dots. Now, if you want, you can set up a track saw or you can... Do whatever you want to do to keep that straight line. I could set up the level and clamp it down to create a fence to run the saw against, but it's not that necessary. Here we go. 
Now again, that's my cutting surface. So from that metal is where the blade touches. Now I've set up my saw, this section here, and that will be stay wood. This black mark actually marks out what the teeth of the saw blade are removing from the surface. So that's the height of the finish that I want. When I'm done my cut, in a perfect world, I should see just a hairline of that pencil. Okay, I'm gonna start off with a square and then I'm gonna finish off just by following my line. Once I'm buried in here, eight to 10 inches, if I keep this on the pencil, and this and this bend of the blade are both up against wood, it creates a straight line for me. So all I gotta do is push. And we'll finish off with the square. There, that was that simple. Now, because we're finishing this door with a stain, I had to remove any of those pencil marks or rubbing my lines. That's great. We just softened up the edge with the palm sander. Now we're ready to put this all back together. The challenge here is we want to have the door attached to the jam when we install it, because it makes things a lot simpler. Now I'm reinstalling the hinges. Not perfectly tight though, because we will be removing the door later, finish off the stain. But in order to install this door properly, we want to have this set up. So now, I've got a nice perfect gap up there, a great gap at the bottom. The last step for an easy install is this. We're gonna take this measurement at an eighth and then an eighth. Now we're gonna take our material. This is our, our casing. It's just square stock. Modern look, it's just square stock. There's no detail, all right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this measurement from the pencil line to the pencil line, which gives us a surface here that material is up against. I can actually cock that gap. That's important because it makes everything look pretty. So we're gonna take our actual measurement of that space, which is actually 29 and a half. Did I read that right? 28 and a half. Wow, that could have been dangerous. 28 and a half. I'm gonna write this down, okay? Plus the width of the casing, two and three quarters, twice. There's five and a half. Plus I wanna have a one inch overhang on the top on each side. I'll show you what I'm doing in a second. But 35, 36. Okay, now we're gonna go to the saw. We're gonna cut the header, because with the header cut, it makes this install really, really easy. And just as a tip for you here, when you're looking at your saw, take a look at where your blade makes contact with the saw. It's pretty much in the middle here. This material is really thin. So if you're measuring and make a mark up here, it's really hard to line up where exactly your blade's gonna touch, because, <laughs> all right. In this scenario, we want 36 inches. So we're gonna mark the lead edge of the material at 36, and then we're gonna slide this across. So our, our blade can actually make contact and we can actually see where the tooth is gonna cut. And that's how you get precision, all right? You hold it firm, you release the safety, get the blade spinning and then go through the material. The amount of times I see a guy and they'll just be chopping through that, which is why we cut a little chop saw, because the blade isn't even spinning when it hits the material. It's really hard on the tool, okay? Now, what we wanna do here, because this is a modern look, we're gonna just do a little bit of a detail. Now this material is two and three quarters. That is the same as one and three eighths. That's the halfway mark. One and three eighths right here. We're gonna throw a 45. Two and three quarters. To cut that in half, you just make that one, and you make this, and you just double the bottom. Double the denominator, all right, and you're fine, three eighths. That's how easy math is. Now we're gonna bring this across, and I'm gonna switch hands, because I don't wanna go cross hand. All right, I wanna make that blade make contact right where the material is. Same with the other side. Now I have a header. So we're gonna do this now, take the same eighth, I'm gonna use my finger as a stopper and I'm gonna just put my mark on each side. Now remember this measurement, this measurement plus casing plus an inch to get us our detail that we like means that I measure back two and three quarter for the trim plus an inch is three and three quarter. I make my mark. Now this is where I'm gonna set it. On that pencil line, this mark lining up with this one. Make sure you're looking straight at it, not on an angle, because that'll lie. If I'm standing on an angle, that looks like it's lined up, but the camera will show you that I'm wrong, right? So make sure that you get in front of your thing that you're measuring every single time. That's the location that we're gonna wanna nail that. When you're working with door jamps and you're adding casing, anywhere you're adding the casing on the door jamp, especially with MDF, you wanna use a thicker nail, okay? You wanna use the 16 gauge. 18 gauge is great for wood, but for this kind of material, the heavier gauge makes it stick better. And you wanna use short nails. Inch and a quarter is plenty here. All right, here we go. Done. 
That was a little too close to the edge though, for my own comfort. Okay. Okay, now I'm gonna show you two different ways to case this. You can nail this in advance, which makes the door installation easy, or you can use an adhesive and nail it after, just in the two corners, and that makes your repairs and your painting easier. So you gotta pick which poison you like or which difficulty you have. If you're a lousy painter, using adhesive and trimming it up might be better, but if you're lousy at carpentry, <laughs> then doing this to install your door might make your life a little easier. Here's why. Now I take my door, I'm setting it in position, And all I have to worry about is making sure the, the front is flush. And it holds it right where I want it. Nice and simple, okay? So one person installation. Now, remember we took a level to this earlier. We were looking at it earlier is the side level. So we can do this. Because we only have a half an inch gap, we can do all the filler on one side. If the wall is level and it's not perfect, the top is in a little bit. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna screw in the top and then we're gonna shim to the bottom. So if it's like this, you start at the top and then you shim out the bottom to get it perfectly level. One of the ways you know that it's leaning right now, watch the door. It wants to close all by itself. Okay, that's a way, good indicator. I'm gonna take my pencil now. I'm just gonna mark right on, this is the door stop. It usually comes delivered with just a couple of pin nails. What I wanna do is I wanna make sure that I am attaching this after the fact, after the install. That's why it's only on two little nails. It's not finished. It's just set there so they don't lose it during shipping. You wanna take that off to install your door. Make sure you have a pair of pliers with you. Remove those nails by rolling it against the material, preferably right where that piece of wood is gonna go back. That way if you make any damage or dents, you don't have to fill them, you're gonna cover them. Now, we wanna use construction screws here. Remember I said that this is inside, so we're gonna start up here between the hinge and that pencil mark. This is holding me flush. So it's not gonna get any more perfect than that. And that's my start. Now I can check to see, I have a nice gap from here to here, so that's no concern. What I do have to worry about now is getting this perfect. You can see, I can move this back and forth, no problem, right? And it's sitting right on the ground. And I can take shims and a hand level and I can go back and forth all day long until I find the sweet spot. Or I can just pull out my laser, stick it on the ground, as square as roughly you can go, and put it on that pencil line up there. That's 1 8th. All I've got to do is tap the bottom of this until I have a 1 8 gap. If I can reach in behind with a full shim, if not, then come from the front, okay? It really all depends on how straight the framing is. A lot of times the framing is twisted, so you can come at it from both sides if you want to. This one's got a bit of a twist, so I'm going to shim right here. And a little bit of resistance there is because the screw caused a bump on the MDF on the backside. So I don't mind if it's a little bit out. What I want to do is make sure that the face of my jam is also plumb. All right, that's good. You see it might push this out just a little bit because when I add my screw, again, I'm between the hinge and my pencil line, so it'll be hidden. Nice and flush. Oh, this actually twisted out. Uh, hang on a second. Uh, we'll try that again. There we go. Now I'm on my 1 8 again. Now there's two ways to cut off extra shims. You can snap and score it and snap it. Or if you have a whole bunch, you can use a multi-tool. Now, depending on the gap here, this might work out really well for me. Okay, there we are. <laughs> All right, now, all we have to do is do the same to this side, but we want to use the door that's hanging off the hinges to set the depth. This is the best system. We've got a pretty consistent gap here. Now, the degree that you want perfection, you can fiddle with this all day long. But the biggest issue is when this material is on and the door is closed, is there a gap? Because this is a privacy issue. As long as there's no gap, then we're fine. Try to keep this edge as straight as possible so your next material will go on looking good. But like I said, because of that 1 8 that we set this back in the caulking line that you're gonna do a concave, a little bit of variance is not the end of the world, okay? Now, let's just trim all this off and we'll show you the casing. I use this tool this time instead of the knife because when it's really thick, you usually have to do a few passes with the knife. That's how I have this scar right here. I was cutting and then I put the knife in my hand and then I grabbed the shim. Something happened and the knife passed through my thumb, opened it right up. It was really not a good day. Next. 
We gotta get these things back on. We're switching over to the 18 gauge now. And I love this. These Craftsman tools are awesome. The V20, I remember growing up in the trades, the only automatic nailers we had were pass load and we had to have gas and battery. They seemed like a convenient tool at the time. But that's only because we didn't have a better option. <laughs> Nowadays, DIY line of tools is far superior to anything the trades had even 10 years ago. Which means, if you're gonna do your own renovations on your own house today, you're working with better materials at an entry-level price point than what the craftsmen and artisans were using just a few years ago. So if you're not happy with your work, don't blame your tools. Probably because you didn't watch enough of my videos. <laughs> my custom doors here are an inch and three quarters thick. So I'm just gonna mark them with my line here at inch three quarters plus a hair, throw in a pencil line, bring this over. There you go, now that sets that. And then I can just adjust this so it gets a nice contact. If you're working with somebody, they can hold the door closed for you. But if you're not, that's how to do it on your own. Ah, we got a door installed. Next thing is the casing. Now we're gonna measure from the floor right up to that lead edge. And we're gonna be as precise as we can. 79 and a half, 79 and 5 eighths, and a bit. That's called measuring, 79 and 5 eighths and a bit. Let's cut that one down. Now when you cut something perfect, it won't fit. Now that's perfect. We're gonna use a two inch nail on the outside of this material to contact with the stud. So jam and then stud. Yep. When you're putting on your casing, you can't just rely on nails on the outside. You've got to put some into the jam itself. So what you want to do is use the inch and a quarter up against the jam piece. You just need a few. That'll make sure that the caulking doesn't get separated over time. When the door's opening and closing, if things cause some twisting motion, that'll save your bacon. Make your life easier while you're finishing. Throw the nails next to each other. All right, and then one closer to the bottom but not right at the bottom, because remember, we always want to use casing that's pre-painted. That keeps the brush away from that wood when we're finishing. Now, it's time for baseboards. So we're gonna show you two different ways to install baseboards on your trim, and how to do the outside corners, because those are key. I got a trick for you I haven't shown you yet. So we're gonna jump into all that, and we're just gonna rearrange all of our equipment to a different part of the room. So, quick little story. I'm at the hardware store today, and I was gonna pick up the liquid no-nail stuff, right? Because it works nice. The one I was at, they didn't have the regular. They had the extra duty. But it was 16 bucks for the two. So I'm like, I'm gonna use this. Eight bucks, two in one seal and bond. Here's the plan. We're gonna install this one with only two nails. We're not going to put the adhesive along the bottom, just along the top, okay? And I'm gonna use the 18 to put this on. So again, I've got my mark, two and three quarters plus the extra inch overhang. Gonna get it lined up on my location. Bam, bam, installed. The only thing left to do now is after I stain the doors, I'm gonna put a bead of caulking on this. And I can press that in. It's gonna make great contact with the drywall surface and I'm good to go. That's if you're not comfortable. Let's just face it, not everybody's gonna have a brad nailer. Maybe you gotta you do a hammer and nails. That's a great technique for you. But for me, I like to grab an inch and a quarter into the jam. I just always like the fact that it's not gonna be moving independently. I'm gonna throw a couple casings on and then we're gonna jump in. We're gonna show you the baseboard technique, why it's so simple and makes your life easy. And then we're gonna do an inside 45 and we're gonna do an outside 45 and show you a couple of different miter joint tricks because we don't have to miter the casings. But if you're gonna trim out a room, you're gonna need a miter joint sooner or later, unless your room is literally just four walls with no outside corners. That would be awesome. Here's our corner. It's a 45. The trick to getting something close to perfect, and it's impossible because of the mud and the joint, you want the backside of that joint in the groove. That's where you want to measure to. Now, had I gone to 46, maybe it'd be perfect, but I don't give a rip because I'm gonna be caulking the joint. Finished carpentry at this level, for 95% of everybody that lives in North America is not about perfection, it's about getting it close. Once you're close, you're as close to perfect as you need to be. So if you take a 45 on the backside of both pieces and you just overlap them in the corner, that's all you need. The wall is gonna have bends, curves, twists. You can't try to make all of your measurements based on that. Set it nice and easy. There's a gap, we'll fix it. I'll show you in a second. But now that I've got that in location, I wanna come over to the other end of this. We're just gonna go like this and set the pencil mark. Now there's my cut for that side. We'll go to the other side and then come over here and make this measurement. Now that's an exact length, but it's also on an open angle. So in this case, I'm gonna put it on the saw standing up and I'm gonna cut the pencil line as well. Cause the pencil represents the end of the board, but if I take off that little 30 seconds of an inch, then it'll fit into the gap. So let me just show you what I mean. We'll cut both of these and stick them in. We can save ourselves a lot of nails just by using a little bit of adhesive, okay? 
Now, I mean, we'll throw one in just for the hell of it, just to help close this gap over here. I'm assuming that there's going to be wood coming off that electro box. Yep, there was. Now let's check this one out and see how that's closing. All right. Now here's how you make a perfect miter joint. Okay. That's it. So we're going to finish nailing this on in just a second, but I got a couple more tricks to show you. We're cutting this. We're going to cut it on a bit of a 45 degree angle, and we're going to start with a small hole. And if we need to, we can always make this hole bigger when we get to it, but I'm going to show you a couple tricks for finishing this off. Height to engage. Now, you'll notice this part of the baseboard is sitting a little bit flush. Nice over here. Okay. And to be honest with you, we don't even know if those nails are going in anything because I've got green board for soundproofing and then drywall. So if you're using that situation, you don't know if you have contact, put the nails in on angles so that it's creating a pinch and that'll keep the board in place. Now over here, I'm off the ground, but because it's MDF, it has a little bit of flexibility. So I'm going to shoot down here and up here a couple of times and it'll help give it some resistance and that should hold it in place. And now we have enough time here for the adhesive on the backside to do its job. As far as caulking is concerned, we have a nice small gap here. We have a small tip. We're gonna set the caulking on there. First, we'll get it flowing nice. Here we go. We're gonna squeeze as we pull, and it leaves a perfect concave line. There isn't even any need to put your finger in that, okay? Slow down while you're recharging the gun. Squeeze again. Now, if you make any issues like this, quick lick and wipe. Off you go. Now, as far as over here is concerned, this is the kind of stuff that everybody wants to know. What I'm doing is I'm using my finger to hold the tube away from the edge. So I'm overfilling that gap. Okay, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come back with a tool. And this tool doesn't have a sharp edge. It has a concave corner on it. And I'm gonna just snow plow and force that material into that gap and leave a perfect concave. Wipe the finger, soften it up. As soon as you do that, you make a dent. You see that? Now there's a dent because I put my finger there. So you don't wanna make a dent. You gotta trust the tool to do the job. One more time, just hold this tight and pull it. Perfect caulking line. Because I use adhesive and nails here, this is not moving. Now I can caulk this gap here pretty much in the same manner. Okay, I'm just gonna use my finger here. Keep the tip away from the edge. Okay, so I have excess material. Now, I'm gonna come over here on the bottom, run it across, make a nice little 45 with my tool, and then run up the inside corner. And now I can pre place my tool here Clean that out. That's the perfect edge as well. And then I can come across the top, clean in all the imperfections and the difference in heights. And remember, when you're dealing with MDF as a baseboard, for whatever reason, they come out of the mill different thicknesses. Your corners are always gonna be atrocious. So having a tool to flatten out those adjustments is money in the bank. That really eliminates the differences. Let's just always start with a clean tip. Drag and pull. No need to clean. Here's an issue where everybody makes a mistake. Oh, they're close together. The paint will solve that. Well, expansion and contraction over time. God help us all. Would it be too much to ask? Just put a little bit of caulking around your baseboard. If there's a shadow, it looks ugly. This is going to be one of these issues that everybody has an issue with, okay? Caulking in your nail holes. If it's an 18 gauge nail hole, you can use caulking. If it's a 16, it's too big a hole for caulking. You got to use dry decks. And as far as the tops of casing is concerned, the only time you have to do the caulking along the top is near stairwells. If it can be seen, it has to look perfect. So if it can be seen, you make it perfect. But if it can't be seen, you don't have to worry about it, right? I mean, if no one's gonna see it, who are you trying to impress? Here we go. Nice, perfect bead. <clears throat> and I use my middle finger because it's the longest one that I got. No offense, a little bit of caulking in the 18 nail hole, no problem, right? Like I said, can't do that in the 16. Let me just get you the dry decks and I'll show you. In case you're not familiar. There, there we go. Yeah, that's right. They have the same technology in this as we had in our paint. And that is it goes on pink and dries white. Now we're just taking a, a little dip. Okay. And it runs smooth. Okay. And then whenever you're using this stuff, you're going to have to sand it afterwards. Okay. You just can't get away from it. Or you're going to have some sort of a mark or a bump or whatever. And that's fine. If you have a system and you know that your nails on the outside are 18s, that's great. Or if you want to get an um, inch and a half 
nails for an 18 inch gun and swap back and forth and back and forth, that's fine too. But you need a two inch nail out here to get through this, through the drywall into the stud. Over here, you're just trying to make contact with the jam. If you use a two inch on any kind of an angle, you run the risk of hitting a screw coming back at you or just hitting the MDF two on the edge and it'll split and throw out. It doesn't take much for an 18 gauge nail to get redirected. Just a little fiber in the wood from the construction process at the plant. It's really, it's not a big thing. So that's why I go with a shorter nail around my doors when I'm trying to be as perfect as possible. And if you got any damage to your wood, that's just shipping damage right there. It's okay to put more than you need because we're gonna sand anyway. And then it'll scream at you and remind you to sand. <laughs> as for the rest of this, these were done with the 18s. The reason we can use our finger to fill that with this, so small that the caulking isn't gonna shrink. These holes are too big, the caulking will shrink. And that is so small that your finger isn't gonna create a dent. Where the 16 gauge is big enough that your finger will create a dent. So take the time while you're doing your carpentry. Keep things perfect as you go. Okay, now we're gonna do an inside corner and an outside corner. Now because we're going straight into these inside corners with no detail, there's no miter. So you just stick it in, measure and cut. Over here we got the same issue going on with the cold air return as the doors. It was set at the height with the assumption of putting vinyl right on the concrete. In this case, don't be afraid to cover it up. You can install the grill right on top of this base because there's no detail and it can go a little higher than it needs to be. All the fins are pointed down. No one's ever gonna notice. It's still gonna function great. Let's not worry about that. Remember when you're doing baseboards, if it fits when you put it in, it's too small. It should have just a little bit of a need for a little bit of love. We'll put that there, a little bend, snap it in. I'm gonna start here. Okay, wood's there. We always have wood beside the cold air return. That's too easy. And on this side, I'm pushing down now. And most electrical boxes are on the right side. If it stays pulled snug like that, you know you found it. All right, in the corner where the floor dips. Okay. Because we're manipulating to follow the contour of the floor, so we don't need an extra piece of trim, you're gonna have gaps open up. Use the tool and the caulking in those situations to create a perfect intersection point. And if the gap is big enough, you might have to come back a second time. That's not the end of the world, all right? If your gap shrinks up when it dries, it was just a little bit too much material and it got small. So add some more and fill it up so that it's not noticeable. Here's my little secret to help make these outside corners a lot easier. Knock off the extra mud, first of all. You don't wanna let the dried up mud dictate to you how the size of your trim is gonna be. Take a scrap piece, lay it up against the wall on both sides, okay? And then measure the gap. And measure backwards, so you're measuring the outside, not the inside. A lot of cases, because of the corners, the trim has to follow a contour, and you wanna make sure that you're measuring the outside point to the outside point. That makes that seven and three quarters in this case. You notice this particular trim here was cut extra long. That's because when you're doing this sort of thing, having the trim meeting off the wall is not a problem. That can be fixed, right? That's just caulking, that solves that problem. Now, here's my secret to doing this. I'm gonna fill up the backside with enough caulking that it has to be pushed into place. And I wanna put it on the outside edge here. Remember, this is just acrylic latex, all right? It cleans up real easy. I'm gonna set it in place. Let me just get that out of the way. Nice and gentle, okay. Now for whatever reason, this one is sticking way out. And you know, these imperfections are gonna happen. Now, I'm trying to create a square environment, so I'm pressing this back. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna take this, my tool, up against the wall, and I'm gonna hold this in place while I put nails just off, set to it. And if it goes a little bit too deep, I'm gonna pull this back out until everything closes up nice and tight. Now, same thing applies. This is just caulking on that corner. When it dries, it might not be perfect. You might need a second coat. So pay attention to it. We're just gonna fill this gap. I'm gonna stick the, the tip right in the hole. Okay, right in there. And then I'm gonna add a little bit extra material, something that I can tool back. All right, there we go. Less is more in this situation. The caulking that we're using as a 40 year, it has the capacity to expand and contract plenty enough, especially for a basement. When you're choosing a method for your house, you gotta take into account a couple things. One, where you live, what kind of weather you get, how consistent is it? If you're in a basement, the temperature in the basement is very consistent year round. There's not as much expansion contraction as there is on a main floor. Contrary, the second floor of the house has the most. Where you work determines what material you use. If I'm gonna be working on a second floor of a house, I use uh, Dynaflex. It has like a 400% expansion contraction. It's worth the 12 bucks a tube. But when I'm working in a basement, a 40 year, $7 tube of caulking is fine. And if you uh, not sure, get the good stuff. You're only gonna need two or three tubes for any project. And so that's 20 bucks well spent or wasted, depending how you look at it. 